reference down. I encourage you to uh, look at this, meditate on it uh, in your own time. But in John's Gospel, uh, John's Gospel chapter 1, if you want to turn there real quickly, John chapter 1, verse 50. Um, This is one of those longer chapters, but it's towards the end here. We have to do things intentionally in our life to keep us from becoming too comfortable in our Christianity, too safe in our prayers, um, too um, obtainable in our dreams. When we understand regardless of who we are, regardless of, of what our problems that we face, regardless of mistakes we've made in the past or what our li- la- physical limitations are, you understand when I say that has nothing to do with what God wants to do through you. I said that has nothing to do with what God wants to do through you. But we often use these excuses and we put safeguards around us so that we don't uh, pray too big of prayers, we don't expect too big of things because we don't want to be disappointed. But this is the words of our Lord Jesus Christ when he spoke here in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 50. Jesus answered and said, Because I said unto you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? He goes on and says, You will see greater things than these. If you don't already in your Bible, just highlight that. You will see greater things than these. You will see greater things. Greater things. Greater than what? Greater than what you've seen so far. Think of the last time God did something amazing in your life and just understand that God wants, to do, wants you to see greater things. Not just Billy Graham, not just Reinhard Bonnke, not just someone else somewhere else. He wants you to see, see with your own eyes the greater things that God wants to do through us. We may remember later on in John's Gospel, he said, the works that I do shall you do and what greater works than these will you do because I go to the Father. And so I want to just remind us that God wants to do some greater things in our lives. And he wants us to see them in this generation, not just the past generation, not just the future generation, not just in Africa, not just in, in, in India, but he wants us to see the greater things in our lives in this day and age. That ought to get us excited a little bit because some of us have got some big problems. Amen? Some of us have got some big issues. Some of us have some big history. But God's got a big future for us. And he wants us to see the greater things, not for a uh, thrill for us, but to demonstrate the greatness of the God that we pray to and that we're believing to move supernaturally in our lives. And so let's just, just pause for just a moment. Let's just pause for just a moment. And just within us, and maybe even just whisper the, whisper the prayer, God, I want to see the greater things. Let's get, make sure that we're not just comfortable coming to church putting in our hour, going home. But that we're believing God for greater things. Not not just for ourselves, folks. It's it's for to do what God wants us to do here on this earth. I'm believing for the greater things. Maybe that'd be a good confession for us to start stirring each other up. I'm believing for the greater things. Well, so-and-so's got cancer. I'm believing for the greater things. So-and-so's got a, a, a financial problem, but I'm believing for the greater things. So-and-so's got kids that aren't saved, but I'm believing for the greater things. So-and-so's got this uh, situation in their life. I'm believing for the greater things. God's got greater promises than any problem we'll ever face. But do we believe for the greater things? Not just to survive, but it's time for us to thrive. Because we have the greater God living in us that wants to do greater works through us. And so we might as well just get after the greater. So what's going to be the determining factor? It's not God. It's us expecting, looking forward, talking about the greatness of our God, believing for the greater things to be working in our lives, and giving Him then the greater glory as we go along. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Well, we, tonight we want to give you your notepad again. So uh, Sage has got this side, I think. Uh, and, and, and who did I have pick the other side over here? Yeah, okay, there we go. So we got our notepads. We're going to pass it out here. Sean's got this side over here. Grab your, we're going to pass the plate. This isn't putting, uh, this is an offering. Uh, you don't have to put any money in this. We're just passing our note plates around tonight. And um, if you weren't here last week, it seems like we got a lot of echo. Is there, is that just me? Is that my head or, or, or but, um, and, and just to understand um, that we just want to review real quickly on Wednesday nights, we're talking about having um, the true biblical understanding of fasting. And so the purpose of turning over the plate. 
the purpose of, of, of controlling our diet, the purpose of passing a meal for a, a day or uh, whether it's just one meal or whether it's a week, whatever we do, there's a variety of different um, forms of fasting you could say that are out there. But it's not the variety that you choose, it's the purpose that always makes the difference. And so with your notepad going on there to, tonight, what I want you to do is in the middle of your plate, why don't you just write the word God, G-O-D, and circle it. God and circle it. Because remember, when we fast, like anything else, really, but especially in fasting, uh, that we need to be God-focused. He needs to be the center. He's the focus in our plate. It's not what food we can put on it. Have you ever been with somebody going through one of those buffets that act like there's only like a one time through? Because, I mean, it's amazing how they can construct, a, a, you know, a mountain out of this uh, as you go through it. But, but we're not seeing how much food we can put on our plate, but we're remembering that we're keeping God focused as the center of fasting and what we're doing and why we're doing it. John Wesley said about fasting... Some have exalted religious fasting beyond all scripture and reason, and others have utterly disregarded it. He's saying this, it seems like you're in one ditch or the other. You're either acting like fasting is going to be the answer to everything, and you get religious about it, when you can do it, when you can't do it, how you're supposed to do it, when you're not supposed to do it, or people get over here on the other side and act like fasting is something that I don't have to do, I'm in the New Testament, I'm under grace, I don't have to be involved in it. So there is a, a, a biblical balance of this spiritual discipline that we need to make sure that we have in our lives. And more than anything, we can remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ when he said in Matthew 6, when you fast. He doesn't tell us how often, he doesn't tell us when we have to do it, but there is the understanding that it needs to be a part of our lives as spiritual beings as we're going forward. Now, let me ask you real quickly. As you look at your plate that you just did that little exercise on, do you see God or do you see the emptiness? You see, many times when we talk about fasting, our focus quickly goes to the food instead of on the focus on God in our life. We need to focus on Him and, and, the, and the fulfillment that he brings into our lives, the purpose, the divine purpose of fasting, of following after him. And this isn't very poetic in the way I've written it, but simply they remind ourselves that the person that has God in their life and nothing else has far more than the person that has their plate full but without God. How many of you have ever said, oh, my plate's just full? Oh, I just got so much going on in my life, I just had more, my plate's just full. I couldn't do one more thing. But is God at the center of all of it? Or are we trying to make room for Him? We look at people and we think, well, they've got all these things, they've got all that stuff. But if they don't have God at the center, the person that has God at the center of their life has more than the person that has everything but God in their life. Not only do they have more resources, they have more purpose, they have more satisfaction, they have more fulfillment in their lives, keeping God first place. We're reminded that when we do have a divine purpose, we'll also have more than human resistance coming against us. When you decide to fast, you have, first of all, your body in your mind quickly starts to say, I'm hungry. But then we start to have spiritual resistance that comes against us. We have the kingdom of darkness that tries to pull us away, to distract us from the spiritual disciplines. Your flesh is one of the ways the enemy tries to control your life. And so when we control our flesh, he loses control over our life. And so he comes against us. You remember Jesus, when he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to fast for 40 days? Remember one of the first things that Satan came? He came to tempt him, turn this, turn this stone into not gold, but what? Isn't that interesting? He didn't tempt him, turn it into diamonds, turn it into bread. What, the, what the, the flesh was craving the most at that particular time, just simple bread. 
And so we, we need to understand that when we move into some of these spiritual uh, uh, disciplines into our lives, that the adversary is going to attack us, but that's because he tries to control us. Remember, we read the scripture, you don't need to turn there, but 1 Corinthians 6, 12, the apostle Paul, great man of God who fasted, he said, I can do anything I want to if Christ has not said no. But some of the things aren't good for me. Even if I'm allowed to do them, I refuse to if I think they might get such a grip on me that I can easily stop when I want. Fasting is one of those areas of our life that when we start to fast, it starts to pull away the layers of the onion in our life. And we start to see different areas that we are starting to be controlled by and we need to break its bondage over our lives. So fasting is an important discipline. Now before we get into tonight's message, and I'm going to just turn to, to Matthew chapter 6 because that's predominantly where we're just going to be at tonight. Matthew chapter 6. We're talking about fasting. The purpose of turning over the plate. I just thought it was interesting to look through the Bible at some of the people that were led by the Spirit, spiritual individuals that fasted. Listen to this. Moses, the lawgiver, fasted. David, the king, the greatest king, fasted. Elijah, the prophet, fasted. Esther, the queen, fasted. Daniel, the seer, fasted. Anna, the prophetess, fasted. Paul, the apostle, fasted. And as we just referred to, Jesus Christ, the incarnate son, fasted. So I think fasting is something that we see Old Testament, New Testament. You see it by those that were prophets, kings, we see it through our Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles in the New Testament. We are encouraged as believers to follow these examples and to practice in our lives. Fasting is something that we do on purpose and with purpose along the way. But as we've seen in Matthew chapter 6, we started last week and we want to continue a little bit more tonight in, that giving, prayer, and fasting go together. These are three spiritual principles and practices that we need to see that, that are often, they're very common in, in how you do them. Now, we've all heard sermons on prayer. We've all heard sermons on giving, amen? If you turn on Christian TV, you've heard a sermon on giving, amen? But most of us haven't heard too much on, on fasting compared to the other three. And yet, as we look at this powerful teaching of Jesus in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, he uses the same phrases on all three of these. All three of these. Write these verses down, and you can look them up as we're popping through it, in Matthew 6, verses 2, 5, and 16. I think we have those. Matthew 6, 2, 5, and 16. Write them down so you can easily refer to them. I'm not going to have them all up on the board. We're just in chapter 6 there, so you can be able to look back and forth. And then Matthew 6, verses 4, 6, and and 18. Matthew 6, 4, 6, and 18. Giving, fasting, and prayer can almost be interjected with these principles that have been given to us on how we are supposed to act, how, what we are supposed to focus on, how we're supposed to deal with the problems that, we, that come along the way. All three of these need to be done in God's way to be able to fulfill His promise along the way. Every single one of them. It's interesting. As we look at these, first of all, all three of them are supposed to be done with humility. Everyone say humility. You said that very humbly. That was very nice of you. Humility. Prayer, giving, and fasting. Every single one of these, if you will look through those scriptures that we just looked there, verses, you'll see that it says when you give, it says give with such humility, give in such secretiveness that your right hand doesn't even know what your left hand is doing. Don't do it boastfully. Don't let people know what you, in, in a very proudful way. Don't, don't uh, you know, they, they would talk to Jesus when the, the, the individuals would come along and, and put the great amount of money into, the, into the, the pot and then the woman, the widow would come and put her two mites quietly into it so that woman is given more than all of them together. Humility. Giving quietly for the purpose of bringing glory to God and obedience to Him. What happens when we give? We are, in a sense, we're fasting. We're taking some of the money that we have and we are not using it, but we're giving it for another purpose. 
we are putting it under the lordship of Christ. How many of you know that your flesh doesn't like to give? Have you ever gone to write out your tithe check and thought, boy, I could use this for? First of all, you start to get really logical and you say, well, I could use this for some of the bills that I have. And the Lord would want me to pay off my, my cell phone bill and some of these other things. He would want me to do that. Then we start to think, then we start to think selfishly. Boy, this money, I could take this and I could, you know what? I work hard for my money. And I could, I could, Dennis deserves this money. The church don't need this money. Who knows what they do with that money? I, I deserve a little bit of this. Maybe I'll give God a little bit, but I think he would want me to have a little bit. We start to think selfishly. And then, and then we start to think greedily. We start to be greedy. And we think, I'm just going to keep it all from me. I've worked hard for it. And I want it all for what I want it all for. And we start to be greedy along the way. How do we stop from becoming greedy? How do we stop from becoming selfish? And how do we stop from just being logical instead of obedient? It's where we do something like this. We give in a biblical way. We give to the needs. Notice here, Matthew chapter 6. Let's look at the first verse. Matthew chapter 6 verse 2. It simply says this. Thus, when you give, not if, when. Say it real loud for me now. When. When you give. He gives instructions from this point on, on how you're supposed to be giving and that humility, that quietness. He says, when you you give, make sure that you give to the needy. Don't sound a trumpet before you do so, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. And in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their rewards. But when you give, when you give, uh, it says, uh, uh, it it goes on and says, but when you give, do it not uh, so that your left hand knows what your right hand is doing. So that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So humility is a part of it. We go on here, we drop down to the next portion of Scripture. And, uh, and, and starting there in verse 5, it says, and when you pray. Verse 2 says, when you give. Verse 5 says, when you pray. He says, don't do it like the hypocrite. Don't go standing outside, making some great eloquent speech outside so that everybody can hear just how well you can talk and how good of a speech you can have. He says, if you do that, that's your reward. But he says, go into the closet. Find a private place. Be humble in your prayers and pray in secret. And your father who is in secret will reward you openly. Isn't it interesting? Exact same words. When you pray and when you give, And he says, and when you do it, do it secretly, having humility in it, and your God, then he will reward you openly. What does it say about fasting? Same thing, verse 16. When you fast. Exact same words. Don't do it like the hypocrites. Don't do it in that way, he said, but doing it in this way. Do it in such a way that humbly, other people don't even necessarily know that you are fasting. But when you do it the, fa- the God's way and you fast in secret, your father who is in sees in secret, he'll reward you openly. Exact same words on all three of these. Exact same principles that have been given to us. Fasting, prayer, and giving should start with a spirit of humility on the inside of us. Our focus is on God, not everybody look what I do. I grew up in a town up in uh, Mount Pleasant, Iowa, outside of Mount Pleasant, Iowa. Small Catholic church. It, it always kind of amazed me because um, in Henry County, there was only one Catholic church in the whole Henry County. Only one. You know, and then come to some place like Quincy where we have several churches in the same town. But there was only one Catholic church. They had kind of a hard time getting people to give to the church until they started publishing people's giving. Giving went way up way up after people's name where, you know, you know, uh, Jane Myros, $50,000, you know, things really, you know, things, things went up, because, but they weren't doing it for the right purpose. We want to make sure that everything we do with humility. 
There's a church over in Bangladesh right now. I understand the play that they're going against. The, the government is taking part of their property that they've had since like 1850 or something like that. Uh, they're wanting to take the property to build a city hall there. They're just, just, they're just taking it. And they're doing a hunger strike to bring attention to the injustice of it. I understand what they're doing, but that's not fasting. A hunger strike is bringing attention to us and the problem that we're facing. I'm not saying what they're doing is wrong. I'm just saying that's not fasting. Fasting is not bringing attention to us. Fasting is when I'm putting my focus on God. Fasting is not me focusing on less food, but really focusing on a, on a feast of God's word and his presence in my life. Isn't it uh, in Matthew, is it Matthew 4, 4, where Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We're feasting on his word. There's a substance that I have, a sustainable substance that I have, even more than food in my life, and that's the word of God. So every one of these, prayer, giving, fasting, we do it with a sense of humility on the inside of us as we come to the Lord. The next one we could see in these three is that they're to be done with consistency. Consistency. We are not told as believers that you have to pray every day, but if you're, if you're a follower of Jesus, you find yourself praying on a regular basis, don't you? We're told that we're supposed to regularly bring the tithe into the storehouse, regularly to pay off of the 10% off of the first fruits of your rent. But fasting is one of those things that we're supposed to be doing consistently in our life also. Not just in an emergency. Not just in a crisis. I fully believe that when, you remember when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration and when he came down, his disciples, some of them were there and there was a demon-possessed person and the, uh, 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 the son of someone that, was, that had brought him. And the father says, your disciples were not able to cast this one out. And Jesus said, this kind comes not out but by prayer and fasting. Some people think, well, I got to fast before I can cast out devils. He didn't fast right then, did he? He turned and rebuked the devil and it fled from him. So what is he meaning? He's saying, you've got to have the consistency of fasting in your life. You've got to have the consistency of controlling your flesh. Because the, when, the, when the disciples tried to do something, the, the, the demon in the boy would manifest itself. and that Well, evidently he's not set free. Jesus just cast the devil on. I don't care what it looks like. The devil's got to go. Fasting helps us to control our flesh that we're focusing more on the power of God than what we see in the natural. Jesus said, this kind comes not out but by prayer and fasting, a consistency in our lifestyle where we're, we're controlling our flesh and believing that God's power is available in our life. Consistency is so important. How often do you, do you pray? Do you only wait until there's an emergency and then pray? Do you only wait until there's a crisis and then cry out? Or do you pray on a regular basis? Your pastor, I have disciplined myself. My feet do not hit the floor until I've been in the, in the throne room of heaven in the morning. I never get out of bed. Never get out of bed. Well, never is a big word there. Once in a while, an emergency might come up or something, you know, but I'm saying I'm disciplining myself. Well, pastor, what do you do, what do, you do there? I just get into God's presence and I just thank him for his greatness. I get in the presence of God and say, regardless of what happens this day, you're going to be the Lord over my life. I, I give to you not, not the, a list of things that I need done, but just I, I just worship God for a few moments before I get out of bed. I spend time in his presence every day before I start my day. Consistency. You think that makes a difference? I'm telling you it makes a huge difference. Because I used to start off my day thinking about everything I got to get done. I used to start my day thinking about all the problems that I have to, have to take care of in my flock. I used to talk, think about all of the situations that I'm going to have to deal with that day. And I tell you what, I stayed in bed extra long back then. I didn't want to start that day. I didn't want to get out of bed. I was almost defeated before I even got up to face the problems. But when I spend time in the, in the, in the presence of God, I'm looking for the problems because I know that God's going to give me the answer along the way. I'm going to be a blessing along the way to somebody. And so, so it, consistency is so important. 
what you do on a regular basis has more of an influence on your life than what you do in a crisis situation. What you do on a regular basis. You know some people that they hit a crisis in their life and they just, they, just, they just don't know what to do. They go berserk, crazy. They're just crazy. You know there's crazy people. It's just when the crisis hits, that's when they go crazy. It shows up. But when we're consistent and we know what to do on a regular basis, when those problems come, we also know what to do in those situations too. Fasting on a regular basis helps control our flesh so that it is not in control when the crisis comes into our lives. So it's important. Giving, it's also something that we need to do consistently. As you see, every Sunday we receive offerings here. Every Sunday we share a truth from God's word so that faith can come alive so we know the purpose of it. But why do we give regularly? Because we are giving God control over our finances regularly in our life. We are keeping that consistent in our life. Remember later on in this chapter and on into seven there where Jesus really talks about where your treasure is, that where your heart be also. Is your treasure at the buffet or the Bible? Is your treasure in your wealth or in God's presence? The Bible says that his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. In the presence of God is where, where we want to keep our focus, keeping our focus on the Lord. These constant, consistent principles that we choose to do. He doesn't give us religious uh, uh, a list that tells us how often we have to do it. He's just saying, hey, be consistent about this. Put it to practice in your life. Have a sense of his greatness in you. I think it's interesting that people talk about a Daniel fast. Anybody heard someone talk about a Daniel fast? Don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but there's no such thing as a Daniel fast. Daniel did not fast. He chose for those three years that he was going to be under control, that he was going to have a diet of that measure. But it wasn't a 30-day fast, a 40-day fast. It wasn't a two-week fast. It was a diet that he chose for the three years he was going to be being instructed by in the king's house and then, from what we understand, probably kept that diet the whole time he was there. But how many of you know that the consistency of him keeping that diet when he had the opportunity to eat all of the good food of the king probably helped him when his adversaries came against him and probably was very influential in his life when they threw him in the lion's den where he did not become part of their diet along the way. You see, he didn't wait until he was facing the lion's den to go on a, a fast. He wasn't, didn't wait until he had opposition from those that were around him and persecution before he went on a fast. He had consistency in his diet until he got to that point. I'm just saying that I think we should have some more consistency. Don't wait till you're at a point where people are against you and you've got this huge problem before you say, okay, I'm going to fast. Don't wait until they're about ready to throw you in the lion's den. Anybody ever been at the top of that hole before and you're about ready to be thrown into the lion's den, that's not a good time to say, I need to fast for 40 days. We've got to be ready for these things. Consistency. So my question is not only when was the last time that you fasted but how often what kind of consistency I don't know about you but it's never convenient to give it's never convenient to pray and it's never convenient to fast so I have to put these things in my life I have to intentionally say that Mondays at noon I'm going to fast Mondays at noon. Well, pastor, what if you have an opportunity to go out to eat? Well, once in a while, you know, I'm not religious about it. I, God's not going to kick me out of church if I, you know, don't do it every Monday. But there's some consistency there. More Mondays than not, I fast. Much more. And so there's some consistency there in our lives that we need to have. Do you have it on your calendar? Today I fast. Today I, I fast lunch. Today I fast supper. Or this week... I'm not going to eat these things, or this is not going to... If you don't write it down, you're probably not going to work the plan in your life and bring consistency. You're going to forget it conveniently. 
along the way. So I encourage you that you have some consistency in our giving, consistency in our prayers, and consistency in our fasting along the way. The third and final thing that we can see tonight through these three spiritual disciplines that we need to be practicing is all three of them were done with expectancy. Every single one of them was done with expectancy. Every single one of them has the same phrase when your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Say reward. Okay, that was humbly, but say it with a little bit more expectancy now. Reward. We like those rewards, don't we? There's nothing wrong with being rewarded. God wants to reward you. You're his children. The reward is not so much that, you know, you, you um, won the lottery. Oh my goodness, isn't that another one going after it? I mean, Betty wanting to win the lottery and, and, and whether they're going to share it or not with somebody. And, uh, I thought it was interesting. I heard on the news just tonight, the only 86% of the possible winning numbers have been chosen. Almost 15% of possible winning numbers are still not chosen out there. Amazing. People still thinking about winning the lottery and filling their plate up with, boy, if I win the lottery, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. What are you doing with it, what you got right now? What are you doing with what you got right now in your life? That's the more important question. Expectancy. When I fast, I expect. Well, the first thing I expect, I expect my flesh to rebel. I'll just be honest. I don't know about your flesh. I don't know how much you got it under control, but my flesh is going to want to rebel. I'm expecting that. I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. I'm going to tell that flesh, yeah, you're hungry, but you're not going to die. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, I know you're weak. Oh, I know that you're thinking about if I could just have this or if I could just have that, but you just need to shut up. I'm talking about me now. I'm talking, I'm, don't, don't take it personally. I just got to, as Paul said, I, got, I treat my flesh roughly. I got to control it and keep it in, in control. So I got to tell, just, I expect my flesh to want what it can't have. So I tell it no. Isn't that what the problem was in the garden? That they didn't tell their flesh no. Well, it was Adam's fault because he was the man and he should have told Eve not to do it. Okay. The woman, she shouldn't have done it. She shouldn't have taken the fruit. And Adam shouldn't have told her to, that, that to have it and they could blame each other. And then, oh yeah, there's the snake and he's the one that made us do it. Will you just, just stop? Your flesh will want what it can't have. You just need to say, I'm focusing more on God than that in my life. So I have an expectancy of that. I have an expectancy that, that, that the serpent is still around. The devil is still here. He's not in, in hell. Satan's not in hell. He is not. He is roaming this earth to and fro like a, a lion seeking whom he may devour. He is not bound up in chains in hell. You can't cast the devil to hell. You can't cast an evil spirit to hell. I've heard people say, I cast you out back, evil spirit back to hell from which you came. You can't do that. You can rebuke an evil spirit. You can take authority of an over an evil spirit, but you don't want to see Jesus cast an evil spirit into hell. You take authority over them, and you got to only take authority when you realize you've got control. If you can't control your flesh, you're not going to control a demon. Amen? So i got to be expecting to control my flesh so that I'll be able to deal with the devil that comes against me, just like Jesus on the Mount of Temptation when he was being tempted there, when the enemy came against him, and he rebuked the devil. He spoke the word and rebuked the devil. i got to be ready for the devil. i got to have a word for the devil. You know what? We're all wanting a word. You've got to have a word for the devil. Do you have a word for the devil? You've got to be ready to give him a word. When the enemy comes, you've got to be ready. You don't say, Pastor, what would be a good scripture at this particular? You've got to be ready. Expect the devil to come. Expect him to tempt you. Expect evil spirits to tempt you along the way. Expect you to, to, to uh, those things along the way. Expect it. And then you'll be ready to give him a word, just like Jesus did. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I'm ready for you, devil. I'm going to give you the same word Jesus gave you, and I expect the same results that Jesus had also. 
Amen. See, things get riled up and you start talking, getting, getting the devil, try to get your attention away from the truth. And, but number three, number three, I expect God to reward me. Now, that's not the purpose of my, of my, tithe, of my tithing. It's not the purpose uh, of my prayer. That's not the purpose of my, my fasting, but it's one of the benefits. It's a benefit. How many of you know the Bible says, Give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. How many of you know that if you give, it, it will be given back? How many of you know scripture after scripture after scripture? More blessed to give than to receive. Giving is there, but there's, there is a reward to the obedience along the way. Malachi tells us that if, if we give, that God will rebuke the devourer over our lives. There's blessings in giving. Nothing wrong with that. There's a reward that's there. Jesus said, if you being evil or natural know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to them that ask him? So it's already his desire to bring rewards into us. Our scripture last year from Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 tells us that, you know, that we're supposed to uh, not only believe in God but also to seek him and that he rewards those that diligently seek him. There's rewards, there's benefits, there's blessings that come along with this. When you pray, what's the reward for prayer? Your prayers get answered. How foolish would it be to pray and not expect God to answer your prayers? How senseless would that be to not have an expectancy? of God to answer the prayers that we pray. So, so we give with an expectancy that God's going to take care of my life. I, I, I pray with an expectancy that God's going to answer my prayers. And I fast with an expectancy that he that sees this in seeker will reward me openly along the way. Now, that's where we kind of open ourselves up because we don't always know how God is going to do the rewarding. We don't always know how God is going to do the blessing along the way. What are some of the rewards that we see from Scripture? Well, I'm out of time tonight, but some of the quick rewards that we see from different individuals throughout the Bible for fasting, we see that there was some that had divine guidance. We see others that um, had uh, revelation. We see others that had divine provision. We see Peter that was fasting on the rooftop when God gave him divine direction and because of him, thank God, we have the gospel that's come to the Gentiles. We see over and over through scripture where there's different benefits that came into people's lives. Now, are you going to get the lottery numbers because you fasted for so many days? Probably not. But do you want the lottery or do you want God? Do you realize that God is more valuable than the lottery? Do we realize that? Do we really, really believe that in the way that we live our lives, in the way that we treat God and these principles? Do you realize people say, well, I don't have the time to pray. If you fast, all of a sudden, you've got some time now. You've got the time that you would be eaten, if I say that correctly. I'm sorry, it's not in perfect English there. But if you have to make your own food, you've got the time of preparation now that you were making dinner, that you don't have to make dinner. You don't have to clean up afterwards. You've got more time. Now, all of a sudden, you've got time to pray. Guess what? You didn't pay for that food. You've got extra money in your pocket now. There's some rewards that are coming along instantaneously right there into our lives and blessings that we, we want in our lives. But the question I guess we have to ask ourselves are, are we expecting his rewards? Should we give? Yes. Is there a God way to give? Yes. Are there rewards to giving? Yes. Should we pray? Yes. Is there a God way to pray? Yes. Are there rewards to praying? Yes. Should we fast? Yes. Is there a God way to fast? Yes. Humility, consistency, expectancy. Are there rewards to fasting? Yes. So are we fasting? Are we keeping God and are we willing to keep Him as that huge part of our life? Fasting helps us to do that. Let me ask real quickly. I'm closing. 
when I ask you to write God in the middle of your plate and circle it, did most of you do something like this? I mean, most of us do something like that. Was there maybe a few of you that did something like that? Where the circle in God's maybe a little bit bigger? I wonder, did any of us do that? Is God just a little part of the plate? Or did we put God and circle the whole thing? He's the whole plate. So often we've got him as just a a part of it. Maybe a little bit in the middle. But this is what we're going for, folks. I'm not saying this is bad. Something's better than nothing, amen? And, 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 And this is... This is good, but this is great. Fasting helps us to enlarge our desire for God. It helps us to stir that holy hunger for Him that nothing else satisfies. Fasting brings into our life that rhythm where I'm focusing more on God because I've got a consistency of disciplining my flesh. It brings into us that, that amazing expectation of what's God going to do? How does God want to use me? Does God want to reveal something in his word to me? Does God want to open up a calling to me? I've got a holy expectation that he's going to reward my life. I'm certainly not going to be allowing my flesh to control me, but I'm allowing God to have first place, second place, third place in my life and fill in my life with his presence. Heavenly Father, thank you.